For our first conversation today, please welcome the CEO of RV Share, John Gray, and the founder and CEO of Under the Doormat, Marilee Carr. And joining us via video, investor and co-founder of HomeAway, Carl Shepard. In conversation with Skift founding editor and executive editor, Dennis Shaw. talk about it. So um, until Dennis comes back, some of the things we wanted to talk about today are kind of where this industry started, where we think it's going. Um, I think there was some interesting stuff yesterday about how, um, how short terminals will merge with hotels over time. And I mean, those are things we can talk about as well while we're waiting for Dennis to come back. Um, Carl, do you have volume? No. Oh. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so it's just us. All right. Um, all right. So I, I will say this is my my first um, hybrid conference where I'm in person and there's people on screens and so far I don't like it. Just <laughs> for, for what it's worth. I mean, <laughs> there was the the whole question of you know I know I'm wearing pants. I don't know if they are. That's a little weird to start with. But then. Um, then now no volume isn't, isn't great. Okay, so just a quick bit of background on, on this space and me. So I, I've worked in this space, uh, short-term rentals. I, I was the third employee at HomeAway, um, started in 2004 when it was an investment that Austin Ventures had made. And you know, funny enough, we were like, well, we were new to this space. We were creating a category. In reality, this is a category that had existed for decades before that and was really brought online in 1997 by, by Verbo or VRBO at the time. And you know, so I've, I was at HomeAway for 13 years through the sale to Expedia. Now I work at a company called RV Share, which is basically the exact same business, but with wheels. And um, that's how I got here. You're stealing all the good questions. Is this working? Yes, it is working. <laughs> so I'm going to fill in until hopefully Dennis, um, or I think here maybe the, the, the tech will, uh, will be done. Um, thanks, both of you, for being here. I agree. It's nicer to be in person. Um, so. My name is Wouter Geertz, and I am a um, research analyst and director of research at Skift Research. So if you want to subscribe, 25% off for all of you today. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I have a few notes here, and I, I'm not wearing my glasses, so I'm, gonna <laughs> I'm going to be reading like this. Dennis obviously was very well prepared. Um, as we just mentioned, he um, wrote a 56,000-word um, well, thesis, I would say, <laughs> um, on um, sort of the history of short-term rentals. Um, it will be going live next Tuesday um, for everyone to read. Um, I hope you can download it as an e-book, because <laughs> I think it's a, probably a good holiday read. Um, so there's, there's a lot of cool storylines, anecdotes, photos, ads from like days past on sort of short-term rentals. How did it come about from sort of the mid-1990s up until today, um, Air Airbnb's IPO, I believe, is sort of where, where it stops. Um, and it took him six months to, to put all of this together. He interviewed 30 people, amongst them the both of you and Carl as well, who hopefully will, will come back at some point. Um, and I think um, it'll be really interesting to just talk through some of the things that you've already talked about with, with, um, um, with Dennis um, while, when you talk to him. Um, He's, he says himself that when you read the oral history, um, if you do, which obviously you will, you'll find newsy stuff, information about behind the scenes negotiations, deals that fell through, insights about important trends and gossipy things, kind of things. Um, for example, you'll read Lawrence Tosi, the former Airbnb CFO, talking about how, how Airbnb looked to acquire Sonder. Um, and how Airbnb developed strategy about professional hosts. Uh, Chip Connolly. Hey, Dennis. Can we hey. hear you? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we oh. can. All right. All right. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Wilder, stay close, though, OK? <laughs> 
Yeah, so it was, uh, as Wada was saying that, uh, yeah, there's, I guarantee you when you read this oral history, um, I don't care how long you've been in the industry, uh, you'll discover things that uh, you didn't know about. Um, for example, uh, Chip Conley, Airbnb's former uh, uh, head of strategy, talks about uh, how he paraded all the major uh, hotel CEOs into Airbnb quietly uh, in 2014. And he got very close to, Airbnb got very close to making some kind of a deep partnership with Marriott around 2015, 2016. And the, by the way he described it, it maybe sounded like maybe it was an investment, uh, but Marriott pulled out and got cold feet. Uh, and Jennifer Shea, who uh, you'll hear later today, uh, she talks about how she incubated uh, Marriott Homes and Villas by Marriott uh, within Marriott around 2017, and how Arnie Sor Sorensen and Stephanie Lenartz really got it, and uh, you know they understood the necess necessity of getting involved in the short-term rental sector, especially when they found out that around 27% of Marriott guests were leaving the platform and booking away from Marriott because they wanted to stay in a home. So there'll be all kinds of things like that. And also on the colorful side, um, there, there, there's things like um, the uh, VRBO, for the first 10 years of its existence, every employee of VRBO was a member of the Church of Nazarene, uh, a church in Colorado. And uh, hey, Carl. Hey, Dennis. Um, <laughs> Nice to have you here. I was just talking about VRBO, the history of VRBO. And, oh, yeah, that um, was, that's a good one. And, <laughs> and, and that came to be important because when uh, the founder of VRBO called up uh, 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 Brian Sharples to his company, uh, he told Brian that, uh, you know, you've been a great partner to us over the years. Uh, you're going to be good to your people. We want, to, uh, we want you to buy us. And then... Also on a colorful note, and um, the founder of Flipkey, uh, TJ Mahoney, uh, he went over to Steve Calfer's house to talk about uh, TripAdvisor buying uh, Flipkey, and, and uh, TJ um, split his head open on a low ceiling in Steve's garage uh, when they were talking about the deal, and, Steve, and uh, TJ said he bled for the deal. And instead... <laughs> And incidentally, Carl, I heard so many good things about you when I was researching this oral history, 30 interviews. Uh, TJ, though, said, um, you eventually became friends, you and TJ, but for several years that you didn't speak, and he said, Carl plays hard. <laughs> so anyway, with that being said, uh, I want to start asking you guys questions. Carl, you and I have been around forever, as have vacation rentals. Um, but take us back to the beginning. You got involved in 2004. You met Brian Sharples. He had a blank $50 million check from Austin Ventures to go build something. Take it from there. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it's pretty easy. We, um, we met through uh, uh, AV. They wanted John Brian to be... The CEO, he was the CEO of residence. He wanted, and they wanted him to buy this horrible, stinky company in Houston. And we met at Starbucks. And I, I said, gee, that sounds dreadful. To, to wake up every day in Houston, Texas sounds absolutely dreadful. Uh, why don't we look for, for something else to do? Uh, and uh, we both liked vacation rentals. We both had kids that were very far apart in age and found out that we traveled that way. Um, the, uh, the, the I used to tell folks at the Homeway uh, financial meetings and and uh, meetings with investors that I had to have you know, you know two two or three bedrooms so that the baby would stay alive and Brian had the same problem he had a had a twelve year old and an eighteen month old and you really had to have these homes um, we did it ourselves our wives had both told us that there's no way they were going to go through the work of finding a vacation rental because it was a lot of work back then. Um, and uh, we just thought we would try to make that easier. Um, long story short, we got together, put together a business plan that uh, we completely threw away when we met the owners of VRBO, Cyber Rentals, Great Rentals, and A1 Vacations, who were the four leading companies. I heard John earlier say that uh, VRBO was ground zero. I don't think so, John. I think 
Cyber Rentals predated them by three years in 1994, but um, Cyber Rentals and all of them, all of those four companies were people who owned vacation rentals, uh, hated their vacation rental property managers, rented them themselves, and they all were advertisers on the first Cyber Rentals. Um, and that's kind of where they got together and started talking about the uh, uh, creating this industry. Carl, could you talk quickly about, uh, they had formed a sort of, sort of pseudo trade organization called renters.org and you and Brian went out to their uh, quarterly sure. meeting. Could you talk about that? Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, the guy, uh, collusion is such an ugly word, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's one of the things that these guys did is that they would get together quarterly at a vacation rental uh, and uh, they would talk about Mainly, they would play poker, but uh, but uh, and and uh, all 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 but one of them drank heavily. But um, they would get together at these meetings, and Brian and I found out that there was going to be one at Depot Bay, Oregon, um, and we went out mainly to to get them. I'm, I'm holding a cup from Hoover's Online, which was my company before Homeway, um, and the dirty little secret about Hoover's Online was that although um, we only covered about ten thousand companies. Uh, we licensed 2 million companies from Dun & Bradstreet to build out Hoover's Online. So I wanted to go to these guys and license their content. The only real goal we had in that meeting was to license their content because, as John can tell you, none of us really believed that those companies could be profitable or could be real. Um, we met them. Brian made the presentation. Um, and then they said, one by one, they came to us and said, you know, we, we're real tired. Um, one of the reasons they had formed renters.org seriously is a, a bank called Robert and Stevenson back in the, in the early 2000s had put these companies together and tried to take them public. They had put together an S1 to buy the four companies and put them together. And that had blown up during the dot-com bust. Um, so they, all, they, they were interested, but they'd been working a long time. And one by one, they'd take us out in these, we were on the coast of Oregon. It was blowing, gale of force winds. We were in the middle of the backyard of this vacation rental. And one by one, they'd say, well, we've been doing this for a while. And our top line revenue is like 5 million. And our EBITDA is like, well, we think it's EBITDA, but it's like four. And we're going, what? What are you talking about? Uh, they were astronomically profitable. And what, when we met with all of them, in the backyard, all but VRBO wanted to sell. So on the uh, way back to Austin, Brian pulled off the highway. He looked at me, he said, Carl, let's just buy those guys. And that's how HomeAway was formed. We just decided to buy those guys. Nice. Um, John, you arrived at HomeAway in 2004. And I have to uh, read you read to you how Carl describes you in the oral history. Oh, <laughs> I'm excited for this. <laughs> so we hired a guy named John Gray in 2004. John was a 20 year, 21 year old recent MBA. He's a brilliant kid, graduated from the University of Texas in two and a half years and got his master's. And so he was a baby. We hired John and John was doing stuff like and then, John, you can describe how you got out your spreadsheet. You had <laughs> cyber rentals and all these companies mailed in, literally mailed in their listings on, on printed paper. Well, a, a, because they, a spreadsheet is a generous way of describing what cyber rentals <laughs> accounting system was at the time. It was someone's checkbook. And um, we asked them to send us their accounting system as part of due diligence. And they sent us a box full of 12,000 documents. And so over a weekend, I went through and found out um, if it was a three month, a six month, or a 12 month subscription, and, and you know, put in the listing numbers and built out this, what is effectively a pivot table database out of it. And that's how we knew how big these companies were. I mean, that's, that's kind of all there was at the time. The other thing that was great about it is there was like a comment section on each of these pieces of paper where <laughs> The, the crew at Cyber Rentals would go in and write what they thought about that owner, and they rarely thought nice things about the owners. <laughs> so, so that was kind of fun. And there were some not nice things about the owners, right? Oh, it was almost entirely not nice things. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, and you said um, you said in the oral history that um, a lot of people ask you about the most pivotal moments at HomeAway because you went on to work at HomeAway till 2017, maybe. Something yeah, like that. I was even at Expedia for a while, so all the way through. Right yep. after after the acquisition, yep. and you said um, a lot of people think um, say to you that. Uh, Maybe it was HomeAway's IPO that was the most important thing, but you think the uh, acquisition of VRBO was the most important thing. So why was that? Without any question, that is the thing that gave us the scale we needed to become the company we became. A, a big part of how we looked at the, the industry early on was that we had to have geographic diversity. So part of the, the reason we bought the companies that we did with the renters.org group plus holiday rentals in Europe was um, that it gave us a geographic diversity of properties across the world. And VRBO was bigger than all of these already, and they already kind of had that. And you know, so when we did the, the purchase of, of VRBO, which Carl and I did not have to join the church in order to buy it, so that was cool, <laughs> um, we, we were able to kind of get that scale and more than double overnight. And then from there, that's, that's kind of what gave us the scale to become a publicly traded company. I don't, I don't know, I think we'd have been running a lot harder to try to produce that without VRBO. And it, it was the thing that just, instantly, you know, it, it's funny because they've now changed the, the name of the business to Verbo. I, I kind of wish we'd have done that back then because it was that much bigger and that much further along. Right. I just have to interject that the origin story of VRBO is amazing. So David Klaus, the founder, was a uh, United Airlines programmer and he started the company in his basement, but he was mastering SEO, uh, search engine op optimization, before or anybody really knew the name of what it was. So he found a way just to appear at the top of listings. You know, this was pre-Google. There were other search engines. And then just people started calling him about, wow, how did you do that? How do we do that? So it, it's a pretty amazing story uh, to read about. Uh, Merrily, so I am not going to go in chronological order because I want to get <laughs> you into this conversation. So you came into the industry. So it's 2013, 2014. You're a triathlete in Europe. You're lugging your bike around to uh, <laughs> vacation rentals because you didn't want to lug your bike into hotels. So how did that, uh, and you're also planning trips for all your friends. How did this lead to founding Under the Dora Mat? Yeah, so I think probably the, the, the one story or the one moment was there were a group of us that went to a triathlon in Lausanne in Switzerland, beautiful place. Um, and we arrived at about 10 p.m. on a Friday. We'd all been working really hard that week. Um, got to the vacation rental, and the hosts were very apologetic that their cleaner hadn't turned up, um, and they'd also forgotten to mention that we'd be cat-sitting. So it was not the experience that we had in mind. Um, <laughs> we, you know, salvaged it, went out to dinner, you know, had a great weekend and, and a great triathlon. But that was kind of when the penny dropped for me that actually... People like us wanted a professional experience. We don't necessarily want the, I don't know, the kind of idiosyncrasies of every host. Um, and what I also realized was that there were so many properties sitting empty and the people who owned them were like me. I was traveling around the world for Shell as, as, as a global manager. And so the people who had the properties were the wrong people to be renting them out. And the people who wanted to rent them wanted a professional experience. They didn't necessarily want me showing up and, you know, organizing the cleaner. Um, and so that was when, uh, for me, uh, having always been a kind of entrepreneurial character stuck in a big corporate, um, I decided that this was finally the thing that I wanted to leave the corporate world for and to set up a business. And it was all around that professionalism um, and, and creating... Uh, hopefully one day a, a global brand that people would understand that they could associate with that quality and high end of the market um, while still experiencing that comfort of a home. Very different than Airbnb, which, which is what I want to talk about next. So, uh, I mean, we have so many topics here, but uh, the emergence of Airbnb, Carl, you have so many um, Brian, young Brian Chesky stories. And so, so talk about the emergence of Airbnb and um, 
what it meant and throw in a couple of stories if you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I, I just talked to Chesky yesterday. So, uh, uh, yeah, Brian, I think the first time we met Brian, uh, John was actually with me. We, we were at some conference, John, in San Francisco, and uh, young Mr. Chesky came up in it and we uh, got to chatting about it. But the emergence of Airbnb was really pretty interesting in the in the company because heretofore, uh, you know, and, and I want to comment on something Marilee was saying. The by 2013, people wanted a professional experience. That was absolutely not the case in 2004 and five. Um, people wanted to deal directly with the managers, and you could tell that because that's where the industry grew. The industry didn't grow in professional management. It grew in homeowners representing themselves. Uh, and that growth is what drove HomeAway. The difference between Airbnb and HomeAway was that Air, they, 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 if you were going to advertise on HomeAway, you had to actually own a second home. You were a property owner. And what Chesky saw, and I don't think he saw it at first. I think that, uh, you know, really he was just trying, his story about the origins of Airbnb is completely true. I mean, he really was sleeping on the floor of an apartment in San Francisco trying to figure out how to pay rent. Um, and renting out the, his his air beds is what, what that's, that's really completely true. But what he had evolved into was it went from private rooms in the back of people's homes to whole apartments. The difference was you didn't own that apartment. You sublet your apartment in New York or Paris or London. And when Brian and I would go out and when my Brian uh, Sharples and I would go out and talk to investors, we'd always say, if Airbnb catches on, it's going to be bigger than Homeway. There's just no question it will be because there are more primary homes than there are secondary homes. So what Chesky kind of did in this industry is he introduced the notion that for the first time to rent short term, you didn't have to have capital. You didn't have to buy a house. You did. You could rent and sublet your apartment. Now, you would be violating your lease in New York and you could get kicked out, but you that that's the problem. People ask us all the time, we bought everybody else, why didn't we buy Airbnb? And I think that the the we, you know, we talked about it. We Brian and uh, Chesky came down to Austin one time and um we went to our new offices in uh on Lamar and and Fifth, uh, Fifth Avenue or Fifth Street and uh, sat in our giant birdhouse and we discussed what what it might look like. But the problem was we were going to go public. And we couldn't figure out how we would rent, write an S-1 that said 50% of our business may be illegal in every country in the world. <laughs> so we, we, we couldn't figure that out. And we also knew that Airbnb would have to go it alone because not only could we not figure out how to write that in our S-1, we knew Booking.com couldn't do it. We knew TripAdvisor couldn't do it. We knew that Expedia couldn't do it, that there was no public company that could take on the risk of buying a company that made its money illegally all over the world. Um, on, at the same time, he's private, and that really enabled him to grow because when governments came after him or after Airbnb, they could just politely decline to engage, and they did that for a long time. And Airbnb grew rapidly because the inventory is free. You didn't have to buy a house. Uh, it was offsetting your expenses, your monthly expenses, as opposed to being profitable. And he was just growing like crazy. He changed the vacation rental industry. I mean, Gray will remember this, but we had big debates of saying, how do we make, make it clear that what you're renting when you rent an Airbnb is not a vacation rental? You're renting somebody's primary home. Somebody's underwear is going to be in the drawer. The, somebody's used ketchup bottle is going to be in the refrigerator. It's just not the same experience. What Brian Chesky taught us over the years is that the public didn't care. Yeah. That, the that public to me wanted is, a great home. Yeah, that to me is, I'm not a big regrets guy, but when I look back at it, something that I would have done differently, I never would have gone into the shared spaces, but I definitely would have gone harder into primary homes. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is people just didn't care if someone lived there most of the time. They didn't mind if there was a door blocked off with someone's underwear in it. We all thought they would. We thought the second home difference was, was really meaningful. I still think the shared space experience versus a, a whole home experience is, is really different. But the primary versus secondary, clearly there was not a ton of support for that difference across a broad travel booking population.
Right. So, so Brian Sharples of Home Away told me that uh, at some point early, you know, maybe uh, 2010 or 2011, uh, some investment bankers came to him and uh, told him he should buy uh, Airbnb for $250 million. Today, it's worth uh, $75 billion. But um, one of the reasons that nobody would touch it was also because it, it was none of the public companies wanted to touch it. It was because it was a, such a loss-making enterprise in the built, you know, in the beginning. And who wants to take that on as a public company? But John, um, so I'm not sure who are on this, but uh, Jeff Hurst, who's now Verbo COO, told me that you guys really underestimated um, the impact of Airbnb in the beginning. Uh, Jeff said you guys viewed it as an adjacent threat. Uh, the ADRs would be much lower because these were, you know, very short stays. So, so what was going on there? Yeah, I think it's a, a pretty classic case of what's described as innovators' dilemma. If you guys have have read that, but basically what happened is they were coming in and booking really short stays, oftentimes shared spaces, but certainly primary homes for much shorter stays and lower rates. And that was not a particularly interesting category for us. We were you know, north of $1,500 a booking, which is obviously a, a lot bigger of a, a target. So, so we thought that we couldn't profitably go into that segment of the business. And, and I think at the time that was certainly true. But what we underestimated is their ability to you know, kind of build a business that wasn't profitable, but was certainly a, a heavy scale business in that segment and then spread into second homes and more expensive bookings that became more profitable for them. Mer Merrily, it's uh, two 2014, you're just forming your company. Uh, was Airbnb a factor then for you? Yes, yeah, so it's interesting. Often I'll get questions from investors about how are you different than Airbnb? And, and fundamentally for me, any company that is professionally managing is by default different because I think the misnomer people have about Airbnb is they are not the owner of a category, they are an OTA. And I think that is something that there's a misconception in, in the consumer mind. Um, so for us, Airbnb was just a channel to market, as was Verbo, Expedia, Booking.com. And so our view was, you know, if you're building a marketplace, the hardest thing to do is to build both sides of the marketplace at once. So what we wanted to do was focus on supply and get the right quality of homes into the portfolio and use the distribution channels that already exist. Because ultimately, you know, and it, it, I was speaking at Expedia last week, and we were talking about, you know, the OTAs are a fantastic way to acquire customers. And so for a young business, that was amazing for us. You know, we got a property, and two weeks later, we had our first booking. You know, as, as an entrepreneur, that's amazing. Um, and so Airbnb was great because it was opening up people's minds to the fact that you could do this. Owners were then thinking, oh, well, I could monetize my primary home or my secondary home in a way that maybe they hadn't thought of before, particularly in cities. And, uh, and then when you combine that with the power of the OTAs to quickly bring you customers and start delivering revenues, that was a great place to be as a young entrepreneur. Merrily, uh, it's, it's 2017. Airbnb acquires luxury retreats. Um, you don't think they've done particularly well in luxury. And then Homes and Villas by Married International comes along. What was so special about that? Um, look, for me, I think one of the really tough things was having come from the big corporate world, I really wanted to set up my company properly. I didn't want to just be fly by the seat of the pants kind of thing. And so we created the right processes, structures, insurances, all the things, because my feeling was if, if you've got a big grand piano and you've got really expensive art on the wall, you want to know that you've got insurance for that property. Um, and most of the companies that were kind of setting up at that time were just like, oh, we'll just post it up on Airbnb and, you know, use their host guarantee. And I'm like, oh, God. Um, but I, I think when Marriott came into the market, for me, it was the very first time that someone audited and cared that we'd set up those structures. And that, for me, was a sign that the market was changing, that that professionalism really mattered. Um, 
And, and so I think that's the role that Marriott played when they came into the market, is that they were trying to take the approaches that they had for hotels and you know, the standards that they expected of their franchisees, et cetera, and of course tweak that for a different market, but they were doing it in a way that meant that the bar had to be raised for almost all the operators who wanted to get onto Marriott. Now, of course, I was really proud because we sailed through that process and were on their platform as one of the early partners. And that was great because it was all, all of a sudden also new demand of the, the quality of guests that we really wanted to attract into the properties that we had. And that for us was an incredible tool to go to owners and say, well, look, these other guys who put you up on Airbnb, you know, you get what you get. Um, with us, actually, we can also get you onto unique platforms like Marriott. And that was, I think, at the time, a unique selling point for us to owners who really were afraid, in many cases, of the types of guests that they would get on Airbnb. Dennis, I just jumped in as a, uh, sorry to butt in, but it's a very important point that I wanted to ask um, all of you, um, less about the history, but where we are today. So I think, Carl, you mentioned this, um, the consumers do not care. They just do not care about the difference between vacation rentals and short-term rentals. Um, why should the industry care? Like, for instance, why doesn't Chesky show up at VRMA? Like, why is he not speaking there? And why is vacation rental industry spending so much time trying to fight a losing battle? Because consumers do not care. Well. Gee, there, there, there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack in that. <laughs> I, I, I think you'd have to ask uh, young Mr. Chesky why he doesn't want to speak at at VRMA. But I think it's I my I opinion used is, to. <laughs> he did once. Um, the I, I think that the real reason that uh, is that that they don't really see themselves as vacational. I mean, Brian Chesky really is leading a revolution in his mind. He's he is he believes that the whole world will go to a place where very few people own anything and they just travel around and that's where they're going to work. And, 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 and he does it himself and his new video is sort of sort of right on track with what he said at Focus Right, you know, all these years ago. The, the, the notion that, of, of why the VRMA continues to fight it is that the VRMA is a very interesting organization. It's, it's made up of professional property managers and very much like Mary Lee is talking about uh, the professionalism, um, they are married to that and they have convinced themselves that most Airbnb owners, uh, host, are not professionals. Um, they fought us for years. I mean, look, VRMA hated HomeAway. I mean, John can remember the first time I went to a VRMA meeting, I told them what we were doing. I met with the board. I got into the elevator after that meeting, and one of the board members was in the elevator with me. He turned and looked in the corner rather than talk to me. He just couldn't stand that we were making didn't, it possible. Didn't people get assaulted? Wasn't there an incident where somebody got assaulted? Uh, oh, yeah, that, 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 there was an incident, but that was that was one of our... That, yeah, that was that, that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Carl, when you yeah. said it's an interesting yeah. organization, that's immediately where my mind went. Like, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, one of one of our lead sales guys got beat up by one of the the software company owners uh, in, in, in a bar at the army. Why why they why they don't like Airbnb? I, it's the same reason they didn't like us. They will eventually embrace it because they have to. To Robert's point. The, industry, the, the consumer doesn't care. And so therefore, these are people, these consumers are staying in private homes. Um, they are competitors with professional managers. They are competitors and uh, Merrily is both a competitor and a customer of Airbnb. Um, I don't quite agree with her assessment that Airbnb is not, is, it, I know they don't manage the properties, but they have created a community that feels like they manage the properties. That's just as valid. And we can try to make the point all day long that they don't manage them. The consumer doesn't care. The consumer is looking for a great experience. And as long as hosts on Airbnb deliver great experiences, Airbnb profits. The host on Verbo already deliver a great experience, but it's a little less, it's a little more spotty on Airbnb, but it's the same experience at the top. 
you were mentioning luxury. They did buy luxury retreats and they closed it down. Why did they do that? They closed it down because their customer doesn't care. A, a, a true luxury customer is not on Airbnb and they're not on VRBO. They, a true luxury customer is not something, is not a do it yourself. Or you, no one clicks here to spend $100,000 a week. Uh, they want something more than you get on Airbnb or Verbo. I think one thing actually though that is interesting is if you look at Europe versus the US, um, you know, I chair the association in the UK. On our board, we have Airbnb, we have Verbo, and, and they were founding members of it together with One Fine Stay and Under the Doormat and other companies. And we also have hosts as members. So I actually think if you look across to Europe, that that kind of tension between professional property managers and you know this kind of host community um, maybe isn't as, as, as quite as distinct. But also, I think what's important is that, you know, we all have to recognize, you know, we heard about the rentalpreneurs and all these things. The people who start as Airbnb hosts are your future property managers in many cases. I think the lines are so blurred that it's actually very short-sighted to see these as two separate things. Well, the, the other thing that Airbnb hosts are is future customers of property management companies. And it would do them well to differentiate themselves as how they can provide service, the property management companies, as opposed to you know trying to do a blood feud with people who are doing the same thing you're doing effectively. Um, I'm you know five years removed from this specific industry at this point, and it is so clear that to me now that this is we just need to orient around demand. What does the demand want, and how can we best organize ourselves around how we improve? how we serve the demand. And the, the kind of border skirmishes on PM versus Furbo or short stay versus um, pro professionally managed are in the minds of the consumers dumb, so we should treat them as dumb and, and move on. But it's, it's also dumb because governments don't care. And we need to be working together on regulatory solutions rather than fighting each other. Yep. Dennis, well, handing it back to you, sorry. Uh, Okay. Uh, we have, if I could yeah. comment on, on that about the gut regulation, Dennis, because regulations yeah. have been a very critical thing. I think that people misunderstand in the, in the history of this industry and, and Airbnb's um, role in it is that bad publicity was great publicity. The fact that they were violating laws and they were being written about all the time, Greg can, tell, can confirm, they were in the press all the time. That brand name was in the press all the time. They knew what they were doing when they were provoking towns and getting in the press. They were building their brand as an iconoclast brand. It was important. They don't want to work with us uh, because actually, if you follow their philosophy, they would prefer to work with host as opposed to the industry. Um, whether or not that's how they actually function, that's how they market themselves. So you have to tie those two things together. As far as the future here, and I think Merrily represents a piece of the future for this industry. I think the nichification of vacation rentals is the next five years, because now there's so many that you're going to have to get specific subgroups. There's the there's the uh, affordable luxury uh, that that that, that it's out there. There are people who want to the categories things that Brian Chesky announced yesterday is very real. Those categories are niches. And now you're going to be able to search within a niche on, on Airbnb. So nichification is, I think, the next thing. And the, the opportunity for entrepreneurs and vacation rentals is to group and curate in a way that, that didn't used to be done. Um, Marilee is, uh, is curating. Uh, she is putting together great homes. Um, and she's very particular about what she represents because she has a, has a goal. That's going to become more and more the norm for new entrepreneurs in the vacational industry, in my opinion. I hope the uh, next step forward in is on the hospitality side. It's just making sure that the experience that people get when they're staying in a vacation home is fairly standard, is as good as what you'd expect to see in a hotel. I personally think the niche thing is a little bit overblown. I think it's a, a pretty simple site feature on Airbnb that you know gets overhyped. But it's, a, it's one of these that Ultimately, when somebody, we need to orient around the job that the demand is trying to do. If I'm coming to a, you know, town for, you know, with my family, with a couple of kids for a week, 
this should be the only option and we should orient around that and kind of steer clear of, of trying to go beat hotels at what hotels do well and just be a very good supply sophisticated version of this incredible experience that we provide to the demand. Yeah, but I also think what's really interesting, and in, you know, a few years ago, um, I was at a hotel investment conference in Berlin, and you know, it really dawned on me that hotels still were at that time not really awake to what this industry is doing. Maybe in the same way that you weren't to Airbnb back at, at the time. Um, and I think what for me is astonishing is that you know, COVID or not COVID, hotels have way deeper pockets than our industry as a general rule. And there's so many investment opportunities for hotels to be entering our market, partnering, acquiring. And, you know, I really hope that they actually don't miss the boat because there's a lot that hotels can bring to this industry, the hospitality, those standards, all those things. And I think there's so many opportunities for companies in our industry and hotels to find those M&A deals or whatever that looks like. Um, and you know, look, that's the theme of this conference. And I think that's a really exciting topic to be exploring of what the future looks like um, because I don't think it's gonna be an us or them kind of thing. I actually think it's gonna be what are those routes to convergence. The other things that hotels could uniquely bring to this industry through partnership is loyalty, right? They have great loyalty programs. Um, everyone's a member of their loyalty programs and being able to tie that into to a vacation rental experience I think would be pretty powerful. Quickly, um, we've heard so much about uh, uh, people, you know, real estate interests getting involved in the sector, people buying uh, second homes expressly to use them as short-term rentals. Uh, and then we have the housing crisis, the affordable housing crisis. And I've heard people say, well, the market will sort of sort that out. Um, there, there's going to be some kind of a back. There already is a backlash against uh, the vacation rental industry. We're seeing the regulations. Where do you, um, all of you, think that's that's going? Well, I think the affordability piece of it is a complete red herring. The people who are, you know, <laughs> on the street looking for housing are not people who are buying a million dollar home that is going to be rented out. Like, I mean, that's, we, we kind of no, listen to are, that. They are, they are um, people, people are knocking at my door uh, looking for a place to rent. And I, I have to say, sorry, it's an Airbnb that, you know, so, I mean, maybe not, people might not be looking at the real luxury properties to live, but they're looking at Airbnb type properties. Well, but you have to look at the average property on Airbnb or Verbo's value compared to what an entry level rent product is in a market. Those are two very different things. And we did a we originally kind of listened to this theory of it hurting affordable housing, and then we commissioned studies on this. And I mean, we're talking two, three standard deviations away in property value of where a vacation rental is compared to where a you know affordable home is. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the other challenge, I mean, look, at the end of the day, for politicians, it's always easier to blame our sector than it is to build new homes. I mean, that takes a lot longer, is a lot harder. So I think there's always going to be a little bit of that. And I think it's up to us as a sector to have the right data to be able to show that these things are, are not always a, a direct correlation. That isn't to say, though, that there aren't some impacts. And I, I think what's going to be important for us as an industry is, is to have that data uh, but I also think what's important is that, you know, we've got to help educate politicians about the complexity. And I think we heard yesterday about how, you know, young people want more flexibility, not less. I mean, the UK government is trying to help people have four or five, six year long leases, but that's actually not what the market wants. Um, and the more that housing and short term rentals converge and people want more flexibility to, you know, go and work for a few months somewhere and do all these things, it becomes harder and harder to distinguish what is a residence or a place to live versus what is a short-term rental? And is there a clear distinction? Well, and one of what I believe is the biggest tailwind for the vacation rental industry, and I mean the RV business for that matter, and travel as a whole, especially on the leisure side, is the idea that people don't want to come to offices anymore, right? Well, the fact that people don't want to come to offices anymore 
also is an opportunity to address affordable housing. You have a tremendous amount of inventory that can now be converted to usable inventory, and, and that's something that you know municipalities would be better using their time on than trying to make vacation rentals affordable as rental units. Carl, parting I, shot. Well, I, I think I think the, the merely uh, I, you can be hopeful that the regulators and the politicians will understand this. But I think your your real point is that the, the first one you made is that they're going to take pot shots at it. But the fact of the matter is, this is not impacting affordable housing. What is afford what is impacting affordable housing is housing policy over the last twenty years in the cities in this country. That's the thing that's driven it. We are going to have to live with it. Uh, as as the uh, as a as the boogeyman, and we are the boogeyman in affordable housing right now. But uh, at the end of the day, this is a property rights issue in the United States, and the the notion is that a short term rental is uh, different from a long term rental only in the number of days. The act is the same, and if we hey. win on that point, uh, I think the consumers win. And to John's point, that if people are going to be able to live and work anywhere, that should be a boon for the central part of this country where housing is affordable and you, there are great schools. And if you can work for from home from, you know, some town in Wichita, Kansas, go do it. Um, Everybody, that's, uh, not, that's not our industry, though. <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, speaking of boogeymen, we have to boogie. So uh, thank you. Read the oral history next week. There's so many topics I wanted to get to we didn't get to. So to be continued. Thanks. Take care. <laughs> Thank you.